This is a Robertson Post Mill. I'm Darren, and this is the Industrial Revolution. I'm here at the Mid-America Windmill Museum in Indiana, and they have an incredible collection of windmills here. Most of them are American-style farm windmills used for pumping water. But they do also have this one, which is a grist mill. Uh, this is modeled after a, the first grist mills built in the U.S., uh, the first one known was also a Robertson Mill, uh, built in Williamsburg, Virginia, in 1621. There's a replica of that operating in Colonial Williamsburg today. The first post mills in general, though, were actually built in the 12th century. They were built to grind grain. They could also uh, be hooked up to lumber mills and cut wood, or they could pump water. Let's go ahead and take a closer look. So if you have a water-powered grist mill, you have a big wheel on the outside of the mill that water hits and it turns that wheel and that produces the power for the mill. This mill works almost exactly the same way so once you get inside the building it's going to look pretty familiar. Outside though there's some extra challenges for windmills. First with water power you can control the amount of power just by opening or closing a sluice gate but there's no sluice gates on the windmill. Modern electrical windmills tend to address this by actually rotating the blades themselves. You can rotate them so that the wind hits the blade at a different angle, anywhere from some optimum angle, which varies by blade design, to get the absolute maximum power, all the way to fully feathered, where the blades are rotated perpendicular to the wind and produce no power at all. Here, though, you adjust the power from the wind by adjusting the sailcloth. The sail stocks, which are what you see here today, are wood frames, sometimes metal in newer versions. They're rigid and can't be rotated or feathered. So instead, you attach fabric sailcloth to the stocks when you want to use the windmill. Just like a sailboat, these are adjustable. For lighter wind, you install the sailcloth so it covers the entire stock. If the wind picks up, you furl part of the sailcloth so it only covers part of the stocks. Depending on wind speed, you might only cover the leading half of the stocks, or maybe the outer portion, or for really strong winds, maybe you only put the sailcloth up covering the inner portion of each blade. Really, any pattern can be done as long as it's the same on all four blades to keep things balanced. In practice, changing the rigging was hard work, and it could take a couple of hours. Most millers probably had two or three ways they liked to rig their sails, and just used whichever they felt would work for the day, hoping the wind didn't change too much. The other problem that windmills face, that water-powered mills don't face, is that the wind, of course, constantly changes directions. Unlike American-style farm windmills, which can automatically turn into the wind thanks to a large vane out the back, or modern wind turbines, which have electric motors to turn them into the wind, post windmills have to be manually turned. At the back of the windmill, there's a large tail post with a tail wheel. This provides some support against the force of the wind, but also a huge lever arm to allow turning this 14-ton structure into the wind. The entire building actually sits on a single pivot with bearings in this case, but it's not easy to turn, typically taking two or three people to rotate into the wind. Fortunately, you don't have to be perfect, so if the wind shifts a few degrees throughout the day, that was okay. Before we go inside though, let's take a look at the base. The huge vertical center post is a couple of feet or around 600 millimeters in diameter. The entire 28,000 pounds or 13,000 kilograms rests directly on this post. Surrounding that post, there's four piers made of concrete and brick in this case. Resting on the piers, the massive horizontal beams which are each about the same size as the center post, are called cross trees. The post goes through those and is supported by the large diagonal quarter bars. And check out these joints that hold everything together. I really love this old woods construction.
Now let's go on inside. The stairs here at the museum are actually fixed to the ground and they don't rotate with this windmill. In production windmills though, the stairs could either be on their own wheels to turn with the mill or even fully supported off the ground. Typically this mill is not open to the public. I want to thank the museum for giving me access to film this so I could share it with you. The ground floor of the main building, called either the house or the buck, is dominated by the huge center post coming up through the hole in the floor and ending on a bearing, seating it to the massive cross beams which support the entire buck. The flour was ground above and came through a chute down to this floor for packaging. The good stuff's upstairs, so let's go up there. As we head upstairs, you can see why it's not typically open to the public. You see the large cog wheel, which is mounted directly to the wind shaft, which holds the sails. Unfortunately, this mill isn't set up to run right now, being partially disassembled. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, because it actually lets us see a bit more than we could otherwise. You can see a couple extra dowels here for the crown gear, as well as a handle that no one can quite identify. At first I thought it was to adjust the stone spacing, but we'll see that later. If you know what the handle is for, please let me know in the comments. This cylindrical crown gear with square holes top and bottom would be held on a large metal bar running from the top millstone, the runner, up through this gear and into the metal bearing you see in the beam above. The two millstones are held inside the wooden skirt. You can see the eye in the center that the grain would feed into. As it is ground, the grain would come out the outside of the stones and be swept around and through a small hole in the floor, through a chute, into a bin downstairs to be bagged. Again, you have more massive construction up here. You have to remember, this building that we're standing in, the Bach, it actually looks solid, but it does rotate, so it has to be extra solid. You can also see the wind shaft coming through here and see that it extends way past the gear and that's to help balance the weight and also to let the back end brace solidly against the back wall. When the wind's blowing, not only is this shaft turning, it's also creating a lot of force into the back wall. So as you can see, it has to be pretty solid. Over against the wall, we found the large metal bar that connects the millstones through the crown gear to actually make everything work. See that fork-shaped fitting at the end? That mates perfectly to the metal piece inside the runner, or the top millstone, to turn it. It also allows the runner to move up and down just slightly to adjust the fineness of the grind. If you'd like more information on millstones, check out my video on millstones, linked in the description. Heading back downstairs, we see that Santa, they're just starting to get prepared for their holiday season, is actually in the role of Master Miller right now. That lever he's almost standing on is the lever used to raise and lower the millstone above. You see how it goes from the upper millstone through the hole in the lower millstone via this heavy metal bar to the wooden timber lever. When fully assembled and running, the metal bar would actually go into this bearing, which would be attached to the timber. Anyway, that lever connects to another lever, which connects to a third lever, which is the one the miller actually adjusts. You can move it up and down quite a bit, and it actually makes really tiny adjustments to the final grind. And when you get the grind just where you want it, you just let the lever sit there, and it stays there. Let's head back outside.
So post mills like this were really the state of the art technology through most of the industrial revolution up until tower mills took over. Uh, tower mills are far taller and they do throw in some extra features. If you've seen my video on this Von windmill up in Holland, Michigan, you'll know about a lot of those. But essentially it is a far higher tower and whereas with the post mill here, the entire building has to rotate. The entire building sits on that one post and you rotate the whole thing. In the case of a Robertson post mill like this, we have about 28,000 pounds or about 13,000 kilograms sitting suspended on this post and that's what you have to rotate. In the case of a tower mill, you might have three, four, five stories high built of stone or brick. And then above that you have some wood and then the very upper level, right where the uh, sails actually connect, uh, you have the axle that comes in and only the top cap on the tower mill actually rotates. And everything else stays the same. Difference here, you have the axle from your sails comes in and it's in a straight line. You have that axle comes in to your grindstone, to the uh, main vertical shaft here, main vertical pole, out to the tail pole. With a tower mill, it still has to be centered horizontally, but it, then the drive for the millstones comes down the dead center of the building. So the cap can rotate, but that ax axle stays in place all the time. It's a lot more expensive. It's a lot more technologically challenging than this. It was more efficient. They could run more than one stone, but didn't happen for a while. So for 600 years and for most of the Industrial Revolution, post mills like this were the Industrial Revolution. Hey, wait a second before you go. Um, I really need your help. Uh, I, I love coming out here and, and filming on location and bringing you all of this great stuff, but it is expensive. Uh, so I need you to help me grow the channel. And the easiest way to do that is just hit like. You know, it's, it's easy, it's quick, costs nothing. Hit like on the video if you haven't already, if you can subscribe and hit notify. Uh, well, YouTube will let you know when I have new stuff coming out. Uh, also, share the video with your friends, share it on social media, let's, let's spread the word. Uh, also, uh, if, if possible, if you can help me out financially, that would be great. It is not cheap coming out here and making these, aside from the fact that I'm spending you know, many, many hours researching and editing videos. Uh, I do have travel costs that I need to cover. Uh, so, the best ways to do that, you can help out on Patreon. Uh, it's patreon.com slash industrial revolution or just hit the super thanks button on YouTube. That works too. Uh, finally, something I've just set up recently. I do have an affiliate store right now. It's just through Amazon. If you hit the shop link on either the end screen, uh, which is probably up on the screen right now, or on the video description or the channel description, they'll take you over to my webpage. I do have some live steam engines there, some, some uh, uh, hand grain grinding equipment there. Uh, but if you follow that link over to Amazon, for example, anything you put in your cart, even if you don't buy the thing on the link, uh, the channel will get a percentage of the entire cart purchase. And that's really gonna help me a lot. It's gonna help me keep making these videos, keep bringing them to you. So thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you next week.